Good evening and uh, welcome to the inaugural session of the Development Sector Dialogues. A series of that will happen on the fourth Saturday of every month. These dialogues hope to bring thought leaders, social entrepreneurs, grassroots practitioners and development sector professionals onto a common platform so that ideas can be exchanged, knowledge and experiences are shared and experiences are shared and solutions to shared challenges can be discussed and hopefully co-crafted and created. In this inaugural session, the question we are asking is this, is COVID the end of the road or a bend in the road ahead? Opportunities and challenges. These sessions are brought to you jointly by We Lead SVYM and Prakalpa Saujanya Foundation. The Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development, we lead, can also be viewed as an acronym for the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership, Education and Development, as these are the three core areas of our engagement. We lead is an initiative of the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, SVYM, which is a development organization engaged in building a new civil society in India through its grassroots to policy level action spanning health, education, community development, and capacity building and training. We Lead is an innovation and capacity building lab where ideas are spawned, innovation is nurtured, and leadership is encouraged. It also encapsulates within, it, within itself an exclusive portfolio of products and programs across the three broad themes of leadership, education, and development. Therefore, We Lead is the place to come to if you're looking to incubate your idea, experiment, build your skill sets, enhance your talent stack, and or contribute to society and make a dent in the sector. Prakalpa Saujanya, which in Sanskrit means Project for Social Good, is a not-for-profit Section 8 company launched in October 2021 with the endeavor to provide affordable solutions for social sector organizations for sustainable outcomes. This initiative was started by a group of project management professionals chartered with the mission to enable the development sector by applying proven processes through domain expertise, collaborative learning, and technology-driven empowerment. Prakalpa has evolved a comprehensive suite of programs focused on enabling, energizing, and empowering organizations in adopting the practitioner's approach with emphasis on delivery of benefits, impact analysis, and sustainability. Prakalpa believes the initiative will en enable social sector organizations to develop more effective and innovative solutions and bring about transformation and change. And uh, we lead SVYM uh, is extremely happy in engaging with uh, Prakalpa. We've already done several programs together, particularly for the social sector. I'm also uh, pleased to introduce the two interlocutors for today's session. Dr. R. Balasubramanyam Balu is a widely respected development activist, leadership trainer, thinker, and writer. After his MBBS, he earned his MPhil in Hospital Administration and Health Systems Management from Bits Pilani. He holds a Master's in Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University. His living habits were greatly influenced by the teachings of Swami Vivekananda, and at the age of 19, he founded the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, based on the principles of Satya, Ahimsa, Seva, and Thyada. He has spent the last 36 years of his life in the service of the rural and tribal poor in the forests of India. He's also the founder and chairman of the Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, a public policy think tank in India. Dr. Balu embodies a rare blend of grassroots and macro perspectives and policy through his multifaceted experience of more than three decades. He's currently visiting professor at Cornell University, USA and at IIT Delhi where he teaches courses on leadership and human development. He coaches and mentors senior leaders in the nonprofit, corporate, government, and educational sectors globally, apart from running leadership workshops for people from these sectors. He was a member of the technical group set up by SEBI for setting up the social stock exchange in India. He's currently full-time member HR in the Capacity Building Commission of the Government of India. He has authored seven books, both in Canada and in English. Today's session will be moderated by Vijay K. Paul. Vijay uh, is a professional with over 38 years of professional experience spanning strategic business management, product life cycle, program, portfolio leadership, business transformation, and human resource management with global corporations and small and medium sector companies. His experience spans IT, ITES, software, and healthcare. 
sectors. Vijay is an electrical engineer from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, and holds a postgraduate diploma in management from IIM Ahmedabad. He's also a project management professional certified in 2006 and holds a Six Sigma Green Belt too. It's over to you both uh, Vijay and uh, <clears throat> Thanks, Ramesh, uh, for setting up the stage and uh, kind introductions. Uh, warm welcome to all the participants and uh, who have joined on the inaugural session of Development Sector Dialogues, brought to you jointly by SVM V Lead and uh, Perkalpa Foundation. Uh, the idea of the building up, ha having a development sector dialogue uh, with a purpose is to build a community of stakeholders for learning from thought leaders, the best practice sharing, and devising solutions for challenges and the problems faced by this particular sector. As we all know, this sector has uh, its own complexity. It has got its own challenges. So we thought that uh, this kind of dialogues, building up a platform, bringing various stakeholders into a learning mode and knowledge sharing could be a best way to really you know, bring in uh, more and more community uh, together around this subject. And uh, <clears throat> for me, what a way to kick off this uh, dialogues by having uh, Dr. Balu, one of the most respected leaders in the sector and in fact, empathic leader and institution builder and author, teacher and mentor par excellence. I personally got benefited by attending one of his programs with the learning and better understanding of the development sector and challenges of building human and uh, social capital. I think this is going to be a great learning experience uh, even for us who are just at the fledgling stage of Parkalpa Sajanya to really learn as to what are the various dimensions and uh, <clears throat> challenges in the development sector. Welcome Dr. Balu. And uh, thanks for ex accepting the, the, the kickoff of the inaugural session of the development sector dialogues. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> yeah. Like every aspect of human existence, COVID has impacted hugely on the non-profit uh, organization. The VUCA factors, you know, VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity in the last few years has placed everyone at, a, at the crossroads. Majority of us are struggling to answer the question, what next, where are we going, where next, how next and why me in the whole context of all this happens uh, somewhere else in the, in, in, the, in the global environment. So the question is that have we reached the end of the road or uh, there is a pathway for us to get over this difficult bend and get back into some kind of more energizing and also in terms of a better path which could be betterment for the future and betterment of the of our beneficiary. Dr. Balu, in this conversation, um, let's try to uh, gaze at the crystal ball and figure out possible directions and options uh, and how to really energize the sector in terms of new new word, new new brave, brave word which is going to come come in front of us. And also to the audience, I request that uh, you can type your questions through the chat, and we will try to address them as we progress with the dialogues. So let me start with the quote from Swami Vivekananda. The sky never changes. It is the cloud that is changing. So indeed, the COVID has come up as a darkest cloud of our lifetime, probably the darkest cloud of the century indeed. So let's, Dr. Walu, let's look at the basic a few things which have happened in, with respect to COVID the pandemic. COVID pandemic is being considered as a black swan event of the century. It has impacted not only human beings, but also the whole animal kingdom and the planet in many, many ways. We have seen, seen not only sufferings, uh, but many heartwarming tales of human nature, be it Corona warriors, healthcare workers, frontline workers, or even local evangelists. And we actually, we should salute them in, in, the, in this context in terms of the amount of work and the, the, the support which they have given to the humanity. COVID is one event in the history which has been impartial to various human beings. It doesn't, didn't care about the, the, the economic conditions. It didn't care about the religion, caste, geographical, or even social parameters. So Dr. Walu, since you are a medical professional and you just talked about you self-medicating and also a thought leader in the development sector, uh, 
uh, what is your perspective in the last two years in terms of downsides or any upsides of the whole events which have happened all around us globally? No, I uh, uh, thank you first uh, for to both We Lead SUIM and uh, Prakalpa Sahojanya Foundation for having me here, especially on your kickoff event itself. I think uh, two years of COVID, uh, it's it's definitely going to be a milestone in every every way that you can imagine, and more so for the development sector itself. The way I see it, I would hesitate to call it a black black swan event because black swan event is something which is completely unexpected, completely. Uh, something which we never even can think of. But I personally believe, though this might have been unexpected, it happened in a sense it was reasonably expected to happen at some point of time and pandemic of this nature. But it caught us all off guard. And the reason I say this is, the way I look at it is, I think uh, I'm not a fatalist or I'm not a person who can predict the future. But one thing is, one thing is definitely sure is that nature is very unforgiving in demanding the consequences for actions that we man, men put up for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And whether it is in the sense that uh, the mm-hmm. research on uh, that's happening in weaponizing viruses, that's been going on for 20 years now, uh, especially in the, in, with coronavirus itself for more than a decade. So it's not something which is unknown. People have been talking about weaponizing coronavirus. We have had SARS epidemic. We have had the MERS epidemic. So it was sort of, in a sense, and expected that some corona outbreak is going to happen. From that, from that space, it's just coincidental that things went wrong at the Wuhan lab and then uh, whether it is started from the bat or started from the lab is inconsequential to me. The, the impact is what we need to look at. So the, the in a sense, uh, event which we were unprepared for, but in a sense, it, it was a rational outcome of the irrational greed of mankind, the way I put it that way. But that being said, what did we learn? I think I'm an eternal optimist. I think there's so much lessons that the COVID crisis have taught us in every space. Like you yourself said, it didn't spare anybody. It was unforgiving of people of class, country, religion. It sort of equalized all of us. It created a level playing field where it showed that every everybody is the same. But more importantly, on one side, it demonstrated the fragility and the vulnerability of mankind. Well, at the other end, it also showed that as much as we can use technology and science for bringing down our own downfall, we can also use it for good. And uh, though a lot of research was happening in the space of vaccines for the coronaviruses, it hasn't, and we could in 12 to 18 months time, the world could actually bring together science, technology, public administration, understanding of biology, epidemiology, the way medicine progressed, the way we started understanding each other, everything everything changed. So the silver lining to me is, we saw what public leadership would look like. We saw what public leadership should not look like. We saw what, how scientific leadership should look like. We also saw how scientific leadership should not look like. So this world has given us enough to learn in the last two years. And if we are uh, if we really learn from it and we don't allow history to repeat itself, I think it's it's something which can give us valuable lessons in the way we can look at uh, understanding these things. And today morning, I was just looking at the Sutra model, the mathematical model for predicting pandemic in India. They had said around uh, 25th is when the peak will happen in India and start going down. And we're just one or two days late, 26 or 27, and we're seeing the peak coming down. So I think the way data can be managed, the way mathematical modeling can converge, where biology, maths, and everything is all coming together was one side. So to me, it, it presented a powerful expression of what humanity can do if we can get together. It showed how compassion can really be. It showed how countries can transcend boundaries and care for each other, whether India is sending out 40% of the vaccines we manufacture globally as part of our responsibility to vaccinate the world. So, or sharing when, when, when people thought HCQS can work and we give thousands of tablets around the world, or when other countries could send ventilators to us, we all shared. Borders became, in a sense, relatively meaningless. So I feel that it, it demonstrated a possibility of how the world can be if only we can transcend this narrowness that we create for ourselves. Well, to me, that is an opportunity. It also showed the good that our people can do when they synergize, people can do when they work together. It showed how sectoral boundaries can dissipate. It showed how the state, the government, especially in the context of India, the private sector and NGOs can work together. Well, it showed the, when some policies can go wrong and the problem of migrants that we had is also real. It also showed how people can come together and work for the migrants' welfare. Yeah. We knew thousands of people who came onto the streets with food, giving, distributing food to people. So it, it brought out 
crisis, the ugly side of it. It also brought out the best side of human behavior and, and humanity at its best. So I personally believe, let's look at the positives. And if we can all work and capitalize on that humanity performing at its best, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. that is the great learning for the development sector. Yeah, great. I think uh, Balu, you set the right tone. I think we have to look at the positive side of it. And on the road, I think a lot of things have happened. Um, a lot of people could have suffered, the humanity could have suffered. But I think this is the time to think in terms of more positive and uh, the new directions and new pathways. Uh, it also comes out that, you know, uh, COVID was also a quick sand and probably uh, millions of people plunged into poverty area and almost 60% of that in South Asia. I think there is a major challenge in terms of how do we bring back some of those. But, it, but in terms of some of the responses, which uh, you already alluded to, in the, how the various uh, NGO sector organization uh, responded to, I think many people came out very quickly and a lot of NGOs and the whole sector came together along with the government and uh, other private sector and any other uh, you know, <clears throat> people involved in this. I think uh, uh, I can group in terms of a few uh, responses which organization came together. One is Humanitarian responses, like you talked about, giving food, shelter, public health guidance in terms of what is it all about, what is COVID all about, uh, clinical responses, that whole uh, <clears throat> doctors and uh, hospitals all together, the science behind the whole thing came together and building up the service delivery system around the hospital sector, uh, health infrastructure alignment, and also building up. I think there's the, a lot of investment has gone into it, although. In the wave two, we have, there were a lot of challenges, but now I think in the wave three, we are seeing that that, that particular quick response which was built over the last one and a half years is giving a lot, lot of good results. And also in terms of a lot of NGOs had an outreach to reach out to people in, the, in their doorsteps. I think, you know, oxygen concentrators being delivered. Uh, I know <clears throat> SBYN themselves set up a call center to link with various uh, people around in the villages, in the, in, in the remote areas and connecting with them and giving the guidance and building up the awareness. I think there has been a lot of response which every, uh, as a human response, which came together. But the question is that, you know, uh, was it uh, really enough or uh, should have, should things would have been in the hindsight is always 2020, but uh, should, should things could have been done in a much more organized way or, or we could have brought our resources much more optimally in, in that kind of, you know, in, in this kind of responses, because a lot of responses were very, very sectoral or more of, you know, silos in the, a lot of people worked in their own silos. I think if you look at the trajectory of two years and the way responses have been titrating itself, re recalibrating The first wave, uh, sorry, I think I got muted. Yeah. Uh, I would say that the last two years and the responses, if you were to look at, and the way the, uh, we have been recalibrating responses. The first wave was when people got taken up by shock. We, we suddenly realized that we don't have resources, but we also discovered resilience and adaptiveness. Whether it's an NGO as an organization, whether it's a country or a state, or even uh, be as people. And in that search for becoming more, uh, learning to cope with the crisis, we had to, and you know, NGOs have this enormous advantage. We are always used to working with limited resources. And those limited resources got stretched. Many of us, uh, at least SVYM, we had to borrow heavily during the time to even survive as an organization, but we learned to cope. But my point is, when it came to the crisis, uh, we became better and better at service delivery. We realized how well we could reach, we could do all that you described. But the second way, if you look at it, was a little more better prepared. We realized that investments need to go in augmenting our capabilities, whether it is setting up oxygen plants, because we, we imagine that the whole problem was around the way the virus behaved in the first wave and mostly in the second wave. So it all built around pulmonological complications, oxygen demands, etc. The third wave has been extremely different, and that exactly shows that we cannot be complacent. Now, my fear is we need to learn to be not complacent now. But the point for most NGOs, the lesson I would say is as much as we discovered how to operate better and more efficiently and effectively in resource limited settings, we need to rediscover ourselves and ask, why did this crisis happen? Could we also now play a role, not just in service delivery, but some asking the most difficult questions of the model of development that the world is following. Asking ourselves questions like, could we have prevented a crisis like the coronavirus crisis if we had all 
uh, uh, created enough advocacy around what could be a better alternate, I wouldn't say alternate, what should be the real mainstream model of development that we could have created for ourselves over the last 30, 40 years. Is consumerism reached a point to where there's no return or can we do something else? Are the current market-driven economic models a problem or a solution? I'm not making any judgments. I'm just saying maybe it's time for NGOs to get into some real deep questions now, to re rediscover ourselves and our are connect with people and say that we are going to use this not just to deliver services better, which is also important, but to ask ourselves to rediscover our relevance and say in the context of the kind of crisis the world is facing or the, we are throwing up for ourselves, how do we even frame our roles from now on? So can we see ourselves beyond just delivering services or being mm -hmm. an outreach partner of the state or of corporates to asking fundamental questions about is the model of development that we are all subscribing to the right model? Or can we make it better? Yes, on one side, we have to alleviate poverty, but can we, can we also understand that in the last two years, possibly the top 10 richest people in the world or the top 10% of the world have generated income far exceeding what they could have done in non-COVID times. Mm -hmm. And as much as uh, people who uh, 80 to 90 percent of the poor have actually gone back to levels of income which was much before COVID times and even come back to the levels of COVID times is going to take them 10 more years. So this economic model is fundamentally flawed and skewed towards the wealthy. So if that is a situation and if they become richer during COVID times and the poor becomes poorer, there's certain very basic questions we need to ask. Is the, is the, is the statement of development that's getting currently fashioned by the wealthy class one-sided and only patronizing themselves or is it really equitable and can address the issues of the poor and we need to ask this difficult question so we need to rediscover activism in a different framework we need to have intellectual activism now and go beyond mm -hmm. just service mm -hmm. activism so i think this is an opportunity for us to pause to reflect re-energize ourselves, reacquire the DNA that this kind of development thinking will ask ourselves and no longer call ourselves even non-government. I think let's mm -hmm. call ourselves development organizations which understands the pulse of the people, thinks with the people, not for the people. And there's a big difference. We need to discover that. We NGOs love to work for people. I think mm -hmm. we need to again say that's all rubbish. That's blasphemy to say I can have work for somebody. But we must say we can work with people and then together say what could be a new solution framework by rediscovering the problem, not as just a consequence of the current economic model, but by the economic model itself being the problem. I know I'm ambitious and I'm very ideal, ideal in my, uh, in my yeah. ask, but I think that is the kind of role that NGOs have to know, start playing. I think great, great direction. And also, I think uh, what you are basically saying is it's not the reset, but it's also a lot of retrospection, introspection, uh, really uh, strategic thinking beyond our boundaries and maybe at a, at, a, at a much larger level in terms of rethinking as to you know, how the humanity has to be really, the issues have to be addressed and how it could be equitable and you know, so many challenges, uh, so many questions which are coming up. And uh, so I think in the whole context, Dr. Balu, there will be always be a short term and there will be medium term and a long term challenges uh, for, uh, for different organization and this sector. So if you look at, let's, let's look at some, discuss some of the short term things which are probably the sector is really facing. Uh, and I'm looking at the macro, more like a uh, impacts at the macro level for the sector itself. So COVID has caused the largest uh, global economic con uh, contraction of almost, for, for almost 80 years. That means that all economies are, India has also gone down in terms of minus 17%, minus 15% is now recovering from there. And the pandemic has also amplified the inequalities like what you have already alluded to in terms of, uh, you know, uh, how uh, the, the people are suffering on one and other people, people are in the stock market, people are booming and uh, people are making billions and billions of dollars. You've got unicorns coming up every third day in India. So there's a whole lot of kind of, you know, uh, the, the, the dispersion of what, what's really happening. And unfortunately, the CSR data from the government is quite alarming today. Uh, CSR spends in 2021, that's the current financial year, has plunged almost 64% from 2020. And the number of projects have actually come down to almost 77%. So that means there is a contraction in terms of the pie, which the development sector has been, you know, looking for. And that's definitely a short-term uh, challenge for a lot of development sector organizations to really make things work or meet their objectives. So how do you see in terms of, uh, in this short term, uh, what, what, what could be the possible 
management or how how the, uh, uh, the, the the development sector organizations really reorganize themselves and look at the market or look at their delivery areas in a in a different way to really cope up with this kind of a pressure challenges see i think uh, uh, the last two years also stretched organizational limits uh, many of them to the point of survival many of them shut down many of them possibly might shut down we had a downsize all kind, all sorts of things have happened to the sector but the more worrisome thing is it has reprioritized priorities itself now an organization like svym if we can speak from our own personal exp- uh, experience we were looking at ourselves as a comprehensive development model kind of an organization which believed in investing on people and building their human and social capital therefore we could actually possibly see how beneficial that kind of investments over the last decade was in enabling communities to become resilient so it was not about svym svym survived not because of our own abilities it is because the communities we worked with we had built their resilience over a decade and investing on their human capital and that's something which we all of us can learn from is what i feel so my belief is the reprioritization was everybody thought investment on healthcare is going to really be important it was not mm. looking at It, it was. It became investments on medical care because the short term became medical care. Now I can understand that the uh, the health sector is going to be the largest growing sector. It's going to demand the highest kind of investments. We're going to make a lot. People can see it as a business prospect. People can see it as investments on human capital, whatever. But we need to understand in the short term, the last one and a half two years, what are people put their money on? What are CSR funds have gone into? It's gone into getting oxygen concentrators. Let's imagine. the thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of oxygen concentrators across india did a lot of help we we at you yourself said we ourselves had were managing on thousand concentrators in the villages of india and we might have saved hundreds of lives there's no disputing it but that was a short term response in a medicalized fashion for a problem which might have surfaced in the third wave might surface the fourth wave we never know how the virus will mutate but it we know i never surface again and oxygen concentrators have a life of their own if you don't use them and let them to rot and if all the uh, the uh, the material in that to produce uh, or to concentrate the oxygen is not going to be properly managed it's going to go down the drain so it's got a life it may be short so we have medicalized the crisis to such an extent that the response has been very medicalized now that we might have some respite the time to look at it would be for us how do we strengthen the systems the health systems to look at healthcare and the resilience of the healthcare system now the way i see it is i am i am extremely proud uh, as an indian that the indian public health system delivered we all as indians criticize ourselves we criticize our systems we criticize our government that's a natural thing for all of us all of us are grown up only on that but if you look at it the system delivered we could immunize no today it's 1. Point, uh, you know it's something like 1.6 billion vaccinations have already been given many of the first doses are close to 70 80% are finished covered possibly the third wave the the, the casualty or the mortality rate is so low because we have done a lot of good work and how did it happen you let just look at india's healthcare system and the way it evolved overnight earlier maybe the children's immunization program which is also very so possibly one of the finest programs in the world for child vaccination around 2.73 crore vaccine uh, uh, children getting vaccinated every year to 1.6 billion people getting vaccinated over the last one year just the same public health system which could hardly uh, you know uh, you know the if you the 2.7 crore it still looks so big but compared to 160 uh, you know 1.6 billion people it looks so small now but we have developed that capacity so our public health systems are delivered public administration is delivered but we have also wasted resources we suddenly discovered that we have we can we can actually fine tune the way resources could be spent a lot of duplication happened a lot of ngos need not have spent so much without they just spoken to each other it exposed the fact that we couldn't converge effectively it exposed the fact that we couldn't collaborate effectively it it also exposed uh, human frailties like human egos in the leadership of ngo sectors and like you know it is a fifth them kind of a approach as much as it brought in all the good i think the the, the what we need to prepare ourselves for is looking at the long term systems as a health system and investing on people's health their ability to cope and be resilient as a community the ability to converge all our services the ability for sectors to continue to work together to solve other problems not just the corona crisis and for ngos to know wake up and say it is time for us to partner 
if SVYM and Saujanya, Prakalpa Saujanya can come together to make the value proposition better, it is for society and community that is going to benefit by it. And we need to cross and transcend this pettiness that sometimes every sector has got and definitely visible in the NGO sector too, and come together and say communities will benefit. If, we can, if the talent pool can be widened, if the resource pool can be widened and therefore made more efficient. So I think as much as effective we were in the crisis, were we as efficient as we could have been, I'm not so certain. We could have been more efficient is my view. And did we strengthen systems to become more resilient? Well, we yeah. enhance our abilities to cope, but the mm -hmm. resiliency and adaptiveness, we could do more. So I think these are areas I would rather look at the medium yeah. term. And for the long term, I would say, challenge the economic model, come up with alternatives, start exploring the for benefit economic model, looking at the fourth sector that can emerge by drawing upon the strength of the goodness of each of these three sectors, the government sector, the private sector, and the civil society sector, and see what works for all this. Create a new model mm -hmm. where this convergence, collaboration, and partnership is embedded in the sector itself. Take, draws the DNA, best DNA of all the three sectors, and creates a new economic fabric where equity is not a slogan, but a lived reality. I think if we, that can be the long-term solution. Yeah. yeah. So what you're saying is that, you no, know, we definitely did a quick fix. Everybody came together in their own way and put the quick fix together. The, 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 the government sector in terms of their resources and everything came together. And we did a lot of great work in terms of, uh, you know, mitigating the major risk. And that's what uh, uh, our the third wave is showing. Uh, this is the cue for the audience. Uh, actually, we're trying to do a quick poll. Uh, of uh, understanding from your perspective within your organization, what is the, well, how, how COVID whole story has impacted you? So there are five questions in the poll. It will come on to your screen. Uh, please answer. Basically in terms of just to get, get an idea of uh, where your uh, the NGO is standing, uh, if you're an NGO partner here, in terms of was it devastating? Are you in an extreme situation or uh, you are kind of a manageable and then probably, you know, probably some, some people might have done better than what they were doing pre-COVID. So we're just trying to get a kind of a very high level idea in terms of how this has been impacted. And I will request Ramesh to maybe after next question, share the poll results. And then we'll queue down to in terms of the next set of yeah, uh, questions. I, I, yeah, I'm just launching the poll now. It's, it's one question with uh, five options. Five options, yeah. <clears throat> Should come up on your screens right now. So while uh, you're answering the poll question, uh, While we are answering the poll question, uh, Dr. Balu, yeah. there is a, another, another dimension which we have seen in some of the studies is that no, uh, the, the dependency of uh, CSR organization or NGOs and development sector organization are been very largely in terms of CSR funds, which are corporate funds, about 44% are. There are a lot of international donor dependent. There is Indian philanthropists uh, and around 16% are individual giving kind of a thing. So uh, with the, like what you said, the government directing a lot of these funds to the uh, combating healthcare challenges and the COVID related issues, uh, there will be a lot of need in terms of fine tuning the for NGOs to at a micro level or their strategic level to look at what, what, what which, which direction they should look at. So uh, can, can you suggest or can, from your experience, can you think that what kind of, let's say, if an NGO has to sit and say, okay, I want to do a, my, more like a whiteboarding of my strategy of next three years after uh, uh, in 2022 onwards. What will you suggest to them in terms of how do they look at inputs and outputs uh, of their organization? I think <clears throat> it, this is a right time for all of us NGOs and SVM has already begun that process is to ask some very difficult existential questions. So the reason why we might have started like in SVM's case 38 years ago to today, society has moved on. A lot of challenges have changed. Our responses might be still societal and we might all exist for the public good, but the way we present the response to the public good has altered. Now, we have to also look at the ecosystem which is rapidly changing, whether it is a legal ecosystem, the legislative ecosystem in this country is also changing every day, whether it's the demands of registration, the income tax, the FCRA laws, the state demands that are being made constantly. You know, I remember when we started SVM and you go file your annual returns, you just go to the office and file your returns and come back. Today, you give one or two percent of your total revenues as a fee, which means you're, you're actually taxing the NGO for existing. You know, mm. It's a very funny situation. That's the kind of change that we are actually paying the government to exist. We're actually doing government's job, but you're actually paying the government to exist to do its job. 
in a sense, right? So things have altered dramatically. So we need to now ask ourselves three or four questions. How do we cope with the le changing legislative ecosystem? Do I understand the law properly? Do I even uh, appreciate what is happening? Second, the, the talent ecosystem is altered. As much as the uh, program ecosystem is altered, societal demands have altered, societal responses, societal demands are altering, even the talent ecosystems are altered. On one side, we see high-end talent thinking social sectors an opportunity. I know there are a lot of programs across the country training corporate leaders to become social sector leaders. It's a very strange thing. And, and, and then we, that's an opportunity as well as a crisis. The opportunity is we can get highly, highly qualified, highly well-trained people in one domain to be using their knowledge in a space where it could be well utilized well for the so system or society. The crisis can be that they might actually be looking at the problem through the lens of the corporate experience that they might have had. You know, it's like uh, that quarter, quarter to quarter bottom line kind of an approach, which I think the CSR world has brought in. Like everybody thinks human development happens in three, three month cycles. Because productions are measured, revenues are measured, bottom lines are measured in three month cycle. Corporates also think that you can measure development also in three month cycles, which is not the reality. There's a lot of lot of changes. So we need to we need to evolve. We can't change that reality, but we need to evolve to present ourselves differently. Emerging technologies is real. We can't run away from it. Whether it is simple things like Facebook, social media, to complex things like metaverse, we have to be ready for it. Now that's that's a universe which none of us are exposed to. It is not, and big data and big data management is real. And we have to be prepared for it. The demands of impact measurement, the demands of accountability frameworks altering is also something we have to ask ourselves. Now today, as much as we ask for good governance from corporates and the Ministry of Corporate Affairs has got its own demands of good governance, I think the ecosystem today is demanding clear governance standards in NGOs. You can't, it is not, it's not like before where you don't even have to be, uh, you can be very opaque about it. Today we've got to be not only transparent, but we have to demonstrate high levels of governance standards, which NGOs don't even understand. So there is, it's not just, it is not just um, not knowing stuff. We can't afford not to know anymore. So whether it is technology managing technology, whether it's governance, whether it is uh, programmatic approaches, whether it is project management. Like I can, you, if somebody had told me 10 years ago, you got to understand project management to run an NGO better. I said, all oh, this is corporate, don't waste my time. <laughs> but today, if you don't talk project management to an NGO, the NGO is wasting its time because they're actually wasting very scarce public resources. So we have to really acquire that kind of knowledge. So whether it's data management, whether it's accounting standards, whether it's demands of transparency, which are real, whether it's public exposure, all these things have altered. Now, more importantly, mobilizing resources is going to alter also. And these are realities we have to be ready for. It's not, no longer can we say CSR funding is the only thing. Now, India is, is one of the few countries in the world. There are 15 countries in the world which are attempted to bring in the social stock exchange. India is the latest. Even small countries like Jamaica have brought it. So India has announced it two years ago. The, most of the rules and regulations have been framed. I'm sure in a month or two, SEBI will actually launch it. It will be embedded in BSC and NSC. The, but the, do any NGO even know what a social stock exchange is? Do they even know how to operate in that marketplace? Because we are all used to philanthropy and donations suddenly being held to uh, held accountable for a deliverable and the impact to be measured and therefore that that so that pile of money being available to us i don't think we have trained ourselves for it so we need to expand our skill sets we need to expand our mindset we need to expand uh, appreciating what community needs are and we need to discover the power and potential of not just mobilizing communities but mobilizing ourselves to work with communities differently which is a big ask. No, we need to professionalize ourselves. Even today, we had a very successful program for 10 years in master's in man uh, development management, which we earlier started off as master's in nonprofit management. But our academic bodies, including UGC, could never understand what we were doing. So we have hit a roadblock now. But we need to really bring in professionalism into the sector. If you want, if you can run business with an MBA, I don't think you should be allowed to run developer only because you have passion. I think those days are gone. You can't simply say, I want to do good. Mm -hmm. We cannot waste mm -hmm. resources by discovering how to do good. You should know how to do good before you get into doing good. So social good mm -hmm. cannot just be a fashion. Social good has mm -hmm. to be a professionally understood, efficiently delivered uh, uh, process, but with passion, with the compassion it demands. So I think we are going through a very complex demand on the system. And that is the kind of strategic thinking organizations need to put in. What kind of technologies can I absorb and cope with? What kind of governance standards do I need to subscribe to? How do I alter my fundraising mechanisms? How do I look at 
I shouldn't even we should not even use the word fundraising anymore. In my opinion, we should look at it as mobilizing resources, of which human resources is one critical component. Material resource could be one. Intellectual resources could be another. Data resource could be another point, and also fiscal resources. Fiscal resources need not just be donations, but it can be several different ways. We need to look at maximizing, uh, you know, mobilizing uh, this resource mobilization process is in a very very professional way, and I think. we should also not forget that communities we serve are also a great resource and let's not ignore them anymore yeah dr wal i think you are throwing a very multi dimensional brave new word and you know there's going to be not many axes and dimensions and challenges coming in front of us but i think basically what you are saying is that you no know, let's do it in a very open minded way and i am reminded of you know a quote from dr apj abdul kalam change is crucial it brings new thoughts and uh, new thoughts uh, lead to innovative actions in the context of the innovation in the new technologies i think there is one question from uh, audience uh, which i want to read out technology drives the riches of the new rich as well as the world in a sense the development sector has been traditionally slow to not only to adopt the tech but also accept the reality of the tech how do you see this going to, uh, going particularly in this particular sector so basically is looking at how do you see the technology adoption what, 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 what you you see that how it how it can come and what are the kind of steps probably this development sector can take to to really you know uh, move for forward in the in the multi dimensional uh, future yeah, i think uh, ngos have to understand that emerging technology is not just uh, social media posts on facebook or uh, twitter Uh, it's not just uh, uh, using a uh, accounting software like tally and saying i become tech savvy i think we need to understand we need to uh, we are, we are all discovering it we are all learning it how do we use technology as an enabler for human development how do you use technology as a leveler for in the digital space for making education available you know sbm has had experiments of distributing tablets to across the across the state and pushing content to children and therefore we could actually manage covid very well uh, or make ensure that educational loss during covid was i won't say at least we could reduce the educational loss i wouldn't say that we could mitigate it completely so i think we need to ask ourselves questions like can i use technology for uh, health not just for uh, you know registering your health card but could it be telemedicine could it be telehealth could it be tele consultation can it be used for educational purposes can it be used as a governance tool today i can understand that most of our governing body meetings don't even happen physically anymore so can we use for capacity building and training can can education shift from brick and mortar ecosystem to digital ecosystem both the physical and digital so we are not prepared for it we don't have the where with all to imagine it so we need to leap frog actually i personally believe being in government now i think government is really moving very fast they are able to maybe because they have got the capacity and the talent bandwidth they are able to acquire things faster i think they are catching up with the private sector sometimes i feel in certain areas we are actually faster than the private sector even we ngo sector have to learn and we have to see when we partner with corporates let not look them as a cash cow only for funds can you look up to corporates and say can you give us technological solutions for development challenges now that's their job so they can think about it and can they help us out can we look at uh, all these people as partners in progress and see what they can bring to the table and if they can bring technology as a resource to the table can we deploy the technology for human betterment so we can look at it in different spaces can we look at creating livelihood opportunities for villages uh business models that can revolve around b2c's and all this uh, business uh, portals that we can create so i think we need to catch up and we ngos have to go beyond the paper the plum pickle thinking uh, and and then look at how do we actually and stop worrying about rural urban for internet it makes no difference and now with penetration being so heavy in a country like india can we learn to discover new mechanisms of not just growing mushroom in a village but ensuring cold storage mm -hmm. and sales across the world so i think that is a kind of large thinking that ngos must get in and i think it's possible and many of them have started i i would be very happy to say that a lot of ngos are trying different experiments and innovations but what we need is a platform where i think organizations like prakalpa saujanya and all should actually cross pollinate this kind of ideas a lot of people are doing it in disparate locations if you can get all these cases together you can get portals and uh, platforms where everybody can share with each other and and look at how do we really uh, get a knowledge repository for each one of us to learn from each other's experiments and for for the social good i think that is the, that is a kind of power of technology can deploy mm -hmm. social media is just one of them 
and like mm-hmm. VR and simulations as learning tools is just another part of it. But I think we need to look at it more comprehensively from data management to fiscal management to sharing information and experiences to cross pollinating learning stories. We need to find ways to deploy technology for the betterment of community and its development. <coughs> yeah. Now, in this context, uh, uh, we talked about early on the other day, and uh, uh, you are talking about uh, whole framework of uh, you know we are relentlessly government is actually trying to look at the in terms of citizen centric services, which is going to be a new new dimension. And you are talking about uh, technology enablement coming in, and which will change the paradigm in a, in a very very different way. So the citizen uh, centric services, either from the government, NGO, or whatever sector, how will they evolve in next, let's say, five to ten years uh, time frame? So I'll I'll give an example of what I'm right now involved in, uh, bringing technology, citizen centricity, and the government. Right now, uh, the the con- the context of what I'm talking is the repeated statement of the Honorable Prime Minister. He keeps talking of Jan Bagidari. So we should need to understand the evolution of the state. Maybe post independence, the context of that time, the social context of that time was we had to have the state being the elder father or the brother providing for us. So state had evolved itself to be a very good provider, from modern bread to making a watch to a telephone. Everything was done by the state to airport to an airline. But if you look at the evolution, the 90s, we became from a provider to provisioner. I remember the eighth plan document and Nasim Rao uh, was the prime minister. He even had a chapter in the planning commission document which said that can we even hand over entire block to an NGO to develop. So they were looking at provisioning services through the intermediary called an NGO. So the thinking was the system had to evolve and retrain itself from a provider approach to provisioning approach. Today, if you look at the context of government, we're talking of partnering. There is no way the state can uh, 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 catalyze or facilitate a $5 trillion economy by itself. It needs private sector. It needs the civil society organization. It needs people. There was no way we could have done 1.6 billion vaccinations if people had not partnered. So we have evidence today of the benefits of partnering. So, but the skill sets to partner is still not there. So the state is now, that is what I would look at. So citizen centricity, I, I and I would like to quote... Um, uh, a senior minister who I was talking to recently, and he said, 2047, we are designing, we are looking at a vision plan for the country. How will India look at 2047? And he was so brilliant in his approach. And he said, uh, he told me, Dr. Bali, you should no longer talk of citizen-centric governance. By 2047, we'll have a government-centric citizen. So we'll have citizens such, such high levels of awareness and enlightenment that they will set the tone for the state to perform. So can we imagine a government centric? I thought that was fabulous visioning to look at a government centric citizen. And that's that possibly that's a journey we have to evolve towards. And I think technology can be great. And I'll give an example of how we are doing that. I'll give two examples and then stop there. One example is the state is now fashioning a, a, a digital, it's just set up a special purpose vehicle, a Section 8 company called IGOT or uh, Karma Yogi Bharat. That's a name given to the company. It looks at, it's an integrated government online training platform. We are now talking about every single of the 4 million government of India employees having access to any time, any place, any subject, any instrument learning. Now, if I, as a government employee working in the health ministry, suddenly discover, and I'll have a system which will throw up my my competency gaps. And I say that I have this following gaps in my behavioral function or domain areas. And these are the eight or 10 or 12 courses I can acquire to remedy those gaps. And I can do it with sitting at home in the evening or while going in the car, I can listen to an audio cassette in bite-sized learning capsules of not more than three to five minutes. We are providing all that today. The state is actually creating a platform which can do proctored assessment of your competency acquisition, which can actually look at a competency passbook that you can have, create a learning hub for you build your competencies and prepare you for the next job that you're doing all using technology. And, and I can have millions of government officials doing it without coming to brick and mortar institutions. So this is the way we're thinking about it. And I'll give a small example. In the, the government of India has got very little citizen touch points. It's mostly at the states to the district level. So it's the, the national government doesn't have many touch points. Look at faceless transactions in IT, the way technology is being deployed. Railways is the largest provider of services in the government of India. And we, we actually did a very thorough study and asked ourselves, what are the points where the citizens are touched by railways? Among the several things we found, there are only 12 or 14 touch points where the citizen is dissatisfied. 
in right from booking a ticket to traveling in a train to the food that you eat or the refund that you don't get when you cancel a ticket you identify pressure points are there and if you can sort out this 12 pressure points the state automatically becomes citizen centric till today we never even knew what are those pressure points so the state had the courage and because the capacity building commission is a body which is uh, mandated to do this we actually did a cognitive ethnographic study mapped out those pressure points designed a training program that is going to be delivered digitally and next month we are going to launch where 1 and 1/2 lakh railway employees who are the front end of the government of india dealing with this 12 pressure points are going to be retrained to be given an in understanding of how do you sort it out i'm not saying we'll solve the problem overnight at least possibly 80% of those pressure points you can be preventatively handled and the remaining 20% maybe we learn from that again and do something back again using the same technology we can talk about all this that the whole program will be rolled out completed in 3 months because of technology this is the power of the state and i hope technology can be used for citizen centric approaches so whether it is this or we're doing another thing for the union territory polices to make them citizen friendly the designed of massive program which is going to get rolled out or the gramin dak saver and the and one and a half lakh postal department employees in the villages of india who are no longer just postmen they are actually financial correspondents they are actually business correspondents for the people they are actually insurance correspondents for the citizens they are the people who matter in a village postal departments flavor has changed they can't even call them postal department anymore they are doing so many other no. things now but this mm-hmm. man in a village can deliver those services he becomes a touch point for them whether it is the ashas anganwadi workers because they are all of the states i am not talking about them i am only talking about government of india bodies tomorrow we are thinking of bsnl is not doing too well maybe if they take change their approach to citizen centricity and become more customer centric maybe things will change so seeing the citizen as a customer for some government department seeing the citizen as the owner in some department context seeing the citizen as the prime driver of governance maybe over 10 to 20 years is the approach the state is taking today and i think that is good news for indians and we need to capitalize on it it's not just the my go portal or the cp grams uh, complaint portal there are all instruments but i think finally we should reach a point where citizens should complain they have nothing to complain about and that is a good state that we all look for wait uh, uh, 10 minutes ago yeah i i am so uh, it's like uh, dr thanks thanks ramesh uh, dr balu it's like you know good old days we used to say change the bios you know <laughs> <laughs> so i think the we are reading towards in that at a, at a such a large scale and you know probably what you are telling me we were, i thought i was sitting in a corporate sector uh, kind of meeting you know where we were talking about a competency gaps and stuff like that fantastic i think this is a brave new feature which is coming up now i have uh, one last question and i have i will request audience to please uh, share your uh, uh, questions then we'll take after that uh, dr balu one question which i have uh, very close to my heart and also i know you are into that space and you are written book also it's about the leadership the how how the leadership should transform themselves in the development sector to actually look at the all the thoughts which we have brought out in terms of multi dimensional changes and you know many things which are going to happen and being agile pivot ourselves in whichever way we are going to do leverage the government uh, kind of you know infrastructure and the kind of you no know, uh, this uh, information management which is coming so what do you think three top points which uh, uh, the, the the development sector leadership should really you know look at themselves and uh, really maybe upskill themselves for future i think it's actually very simple and i would go back to where i get my energy and spirit from so we wake up those words he said only three things are required you know, he always put it as 333 he is very fond of the three i think it's he said hard to three h he said the hard to feel the head to think and the hands to work and this is a mantra which can never change especially for people like me what is leadership all about leadership is about motivation leadership is about strategy leadership is about action and hard to feel is motivation we have to be inspired and motivated to create public good we have to constantly challenge ourselves to move the boundaries of what public good is going to be we have to seek models how do we ensure private gains while enabling public good the the head to think is strategy we need to keep expanding our talent bandwidth we need to uh, today's development sector leaders have to lead the learning process and they have to learn how to keep the leading process alive and the strategy is all about that understanding the external ecosystem understanding the external uh, system in terms of the resource mobilization the legal basis the governance standards all this and then responding to that and the hands to work we cannot simply be 
generals standing behind our soldiers. We got to be generals along with our soldiers and learning to take it forward. We need to acquire skills of collaboration. We need to acquire skills of partnership. We need to subsume our egos. In fact, I think we should be noticed more by our absence than by our presence. And if leadership can understand that it is simply understanding ourselves, understanding the ecosystem around us, the others around us, and understanding the action that connects the self to the others. And I think that is what leadership should be for the civil society space. And this is for everybody in general, but we need to see leadership as an opportunity, as a privilege to actually enable public good without being seen or heard. I think we need to understand that subsuming ego is as critical as expressing leadership. And if we can do this effectively, I think the world is going to be a better place. Great. Very nice. I think very simply put and uh, very profound. So I'd like to pick up one question uh, from the audience is, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more in terms of intellectual activism, you know, with the word which you use and, you know, how we have, uh, how it can be leveraged by, you know, not only development sector for everybody, you know, in terms of what, 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 what are your deeper thoughts around that in the intellectual individualism? See, I think I, I'm glad somebody asked it. I would like to deconstruct it a bit. Intellectual activism is not intellectual arrogance. Intellectual activism is born from intellectual humility, where I know how much I know. I also know how much I don't know. I also know that I need to know what I don't know. Intellectual activism is having the courage to speak truth to power. Intellectual activism is having the courage to say, I'm incompetent. I don't know what the answer is. Intellectual, uh, intellectual activism is not only appreciating my competence, but also appreciating other people's competence around me. Also appreciating my incompetence as much as other people's incompetence. Intellectual activism is also having the courage not to be judgmental about other people's opinions and ideas and perspectives, but not necessarily thinking that mine is always right. Giving ourselves the space to make mistakes is, is that space of intellectual activism. So it is learning to operate from zones of incompetence learning to be humble enough to keep learning all the time, learning to appreciate that others may be having the right answers and I may not have a, all the answers for myself and I, learning to operate in that space of self-actualization where we realize that I may be right, you may be right, both of us may be right, both of us may be wrong. Let's explore it together. Having the courage to say that let's co-generate solutions. I may see with my intellectual abilities and skill set and training, I may see the problem from one lens but I know I'm telling myself that my lens may not be the only way of seeing it. There may be four other lenses, having the courage to collaborate with the four other people, appreciate it from all the viewpoints, and then together co-discover what the problem could really be. And in that space, have the courage to adventure, to co-create a solution, which may also fail. And that to me is intellectual activism. And if we can create that environment through this kind of dialogues, I think that will be the world we should all look forward to. Very nice. Very, very nice, Dr. Balu. Okay, uh, before we conclude, I will just like to share the poll results and uh, how it has come. Uh, I was kind of anticipating a very depressing scenario, but I want to share with you that you no, know, uh, very, I mean, none of the respondents have said that you no, know, they were devastated I and mean, people are surviving. I think almost 55% people are saying that they've been able to manage, and another 30% people are saying that you no, know, they are kind of neutral. So it's a good news. From the audience here that no yes i think we have passed through the test of covid for last two and a half years and it's in we are actually in a very very positive note so before i conclude uh, dr balu thank you so much really appreciate all the thoughts which you have shared with us and uh, they are also uh, kind of you no know, apprehending them and bringing them together probably now it's it's for us to really take these thoughts to, to give forward through the dialogues and you know bring it to next level of people and see how we can you know, germinate the seeds around and uh, get the new brave world going. So before I conclude, I would just like to share two quotes from uh, Swami Vivekananda. Uh, first quote is, to succeed, you must have tremendous perseverance, tremendous willpower, work hand, hard, and you will reach the goal. So like what we said, it's not the reset. I think it's a, a kind of a reconvening ourselves. Look at what, what the world is going around. Let's, let's share thoughts. Let's share our imagination and see where we can go forward. And we have got technology, we have got people, we've got a talent and everything behind us. So, so that's the way to go forward. And the last is from Helen Keller. I think she was one of the intellectuals and uh, had disabilities. A bend in the road is not the end of the road, unless you fail to take a turn. So the time has come to assess, rejuvenate, 
replan uh, relook at ourselves look at strengths and weaknesses make the right turn towards the brave new world of the post covid era so i think uh, definitely we are on a bend probably it was a you know road which bbmp keeps digging up all over the place for us but definitely i think you know the the, the new roads are going to emerge new new forks are going to emerge and uh, with this uh, positive note and a great conversation with dr balu uh, being privileged to conduct it uh, i am now giving to uh, mr amar amar baskar is also our uh, <coughs> founder and uh, director of uh, prakalpa saujanya to uh, give a vote of thanks amar is uh, one of the very accomplished uh, professional having worked in ibm for uh, many many years he is a great leader having le- led our pmi bangalore chapter as president for many years and also he is uh, one of the person who is kind of uh, thoroughly 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 committed to the cause and what we are going ahead with so amar to you and uh, please uh, for your vote of thanks to everybody thank you vijay uh first of all um, I, you know a big thanks to uh, dr balu for accepting to be here on our inaugural session i was thoroughly impressed and uh, absolutely delighted to see the gamut of uh, discussion that we had today the, uh, the whole idea started with uh, covid giving us such a uh, challenge and has been seen as a big opportunity as well and dr balu highlighted how the world has changed all around us <laughs> and how people have come together for the humanitarian cause borders have been dismantled kind of to to really help for this cause and how all this could have happened you know i had you not uh, put all our things together in place and ngo love to work for people and the new paradigm that dr balu gave us today is work with people <laughs> i really appreciate uh, that paradigm shift so it was a fantastic uh, uh, energy that was brought in and this really helps us to reprioritize your priorities uh, and and that was another one which i picked up uh, in this whole scenario and in project management space that we have worked so far prioritizing is everything and you do that every day <laughs> every day in and day out in terms of training so uh, the whole healthcare system has had some kind of a quick fix we talked about that and we also talked about the um, the csr funding should not be looked at just about the cash but actually see how they could be involved in some amount of the technology and the solution and the ngo should really be able to catch up with that and especially look at it as mobilizing of the resources uh these were very good points that came up as a real openness to change the way uh we work at things we look at things when we put together projects and programs for the social cause um these were fantastic uh, inputs about the vision thought that you had shared with us uh, which came up from the government to make that into a uh, you know a uh, uh, citizen centric approach and seeing how the whole world around us can change if you uh, do this approach and look at the citizens as your customers Uh, we have at many times in the corporates look at the customer centric approach for various processes but i think this paradigm in, in looking at citizens centric approach in serving uh, will really really benefit and the whole world will change you also lastly concluded about the leadership part uh, which is something fantastic in a very very simplistic way you had put across how we should learn to keep leading the process and also you know lead to keep learning um uh, very nice uh, things which came up today uh, in this whole discussion uh, so team all of you who really made it for this event uh, a real big thanks and this is going to happen uh, every month on the fourth saturday as uh, ramesh announced earlier uh, so at the same time rain or shine 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. the program happens. Stay happens, and so we really would like to have uh, on the chat window if you can type out what are the kind of relevant topics that you may want to see in this forum, uh, which will help all of us uh, really you know work more efficiently and effectively, as uh, Dr. Balu had uh, really uh, envisioned. So some of the 
topics that we're talking about is in funding in a constrained economic environment, writing proposals, winning proposals, you know, some of these operational things, getting right talent and retention. How do you retain them? You want to train them as well. Leadership that uh, Dr. Bado already alluded to and uh, those type of programs. Uh, succession planning in organizations, managing teams, and so on. There have been several such points that we have already thought about um, to bring to the table uh, in this forum. And we would really appreciate um, your inputs and feedback in terms of the um, topics that we can take up, which will be of great help and use uh, uh, to this forum. Uh, with those uh, thoughts, I would once again really, really thank, uh, you know, uh, SUYM and we lead organizations coming together. We made a very humble start, uh, just started off over the last year. Uh, however, our endeavor is to really help the uh, sector in uh, realizing the benefits, delivery of benefits, and see how sustainability is obtained. Uh, so with that approach, uh, we have framed programs which will help, and there's going to be some PM workshops uh, which will also be coming up towards the end of February and March, where our learning process is hands-on. And so that you get various types of processes which actually are practical and usable immediately. There's a very less of the theory and more of the practice uh, in, in terms of uh, imbibing those ideas, taking them to the implementation in your various projects that would be of immediate benefit and help. So we look forward uh, to your participation in those programs and um, you know you can enroll for them and uh, we could be able to take that forward. So with those uh, remarks, uh, again, Ramesh, uh, Mr. Praveen, Ms. Kumar, and Dr. Badu, and Emma Badu as well. Thank you so much uh, for this participation. I really help and uh, thank for all your support and guidance. Uh, thank you so much. Over to you. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I have nothing more to add. I think we've covered the entire uh, but, uh, Like we said, we'll have it on the fourth Saturday of uh, every month. And uh, end of February or uh, March, we will have the project management workshop at Relit uh, campus itself. Uh, it would be uh, primarily for uh, the NGO sector. That we'll be launching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.